Hello and welcome to the 15th Wednesday Social Brussels in association with Metro AG. Whether you're watching on the dedicated website, brussels-wednesdaysocial.eu, that's brussels-wednesdaysocial.eu, or you're watching on Forum Europe's uh, YouTube live page or the European Movement International's Twitter or Facebook feeds, you're all very welcome. My name is Joe Lynham and I present a program called The Newsroom on the BBC World Service and BBC Radio 4. And before that, I was a business correspondent on television and radio for the BBC. Uh, first of all, I hope all of you and your family and your friends are keeping well amid this awful pandemic uh, that has taken so many lives in Europe and ruined so many livelihoods over the last uh, nine months or so. The good news is that a vaccine is on its way, and I think there wasn't a single person that didn't welcome the news and wasn't slightly overjoyed to hear the news that uh, a German company, BioNTech, which is funded by European taxpayers and led by Turkish immigrants, has found a vaccine which has 90% or more efficacy. Today, we're going to focus on democracy, though, and the rule of law, and what is the role of the EU and European business as well as civil society in upholding the rule of law. And by that we mean, of course, the independence of judges and full freedom of the press, as well as transparency of government and everyone being equal in the eyes of the law. In recent years, though, we've seen an erosion in these values within EU member states, two in particular who you will hear of in the course of today. As you know, the European institutions were set up after the war to protect and preserve democracy and it did that through the application of agreed rules. Without those agreed rules, there would be no international institutions such as the EU, the UN, the World Trade Organization, I can name a dozen more. You will all know that the European Parliament has made the application of the rule of law a condition for its approval of the next MFF, or multi-annual financial framework, or budget in plain language, for the next seven years. And in the last few days, the Parliament, the EU Council and the Commission have agreed a new set of rules, which will no doubt, which we will no doubt hear from from our guests shortly. As usual, on uh, Brussels Wednesday social events, we have a great panel. We have Nikolai, uh, Renata Nikolai, excuse me, the chef de cabinet for Commissioner Vera Jourova. We have Carl Dolan, uh, the deputy director and head of advocacy for the Open Society European Policy Institute. We have Claire Forçon from the Women's Lobby and Marc Alexander Friedrich, who is the head of international affairs with Metro AG. As you can see, all of their bios are visible on the website, which is brussels-wednesdaysocial.eu, where you all registered to attend this event. We will be asking three big questions today. What will the state of European democracy be like in the months and years to come? How will the Commission use the tools at its disposal to foresee and address future challenges with respect to the rule of law? What role can business and civil society play in the defense of democracy and the rule of law? Of course, you can participate in today's event, as is always the case in Wednesday Socials. Have a look on the right-hand side of your screen. You will see the Slido facility uh, within the platform. Uh, and type your uh, type in your questions. It's kind of like a question and answer thing. While you're asking your question, please state who you are, who you work for, or who you represent, and who you'd like to address the question to, if you have a preference. preference. Uh, and of course, if you're commenting on Twitter, please use the hashtag, hashtag WSBRU, WSBRU. It's all on the record, so please be nice to each other. First of all, I'd like to invite Renata Nikolai from the Eurova Cabinet to speak for a few minutes as to where we stand on the rule of law and any outstanding action that uh, the Commission intends to take. Renata, over to you. Renata, it's over to you. I'm not sure Renata can hear us. I think her screen might have frozen. Renata, are you with us? All right. I'm not sure we have Renata. So I wonder if we could go to Carl Dolan, if Carl can hear us. Carl, can you hear us? 
Okay. Unmute yourself and let us know if you can hear us. Uh, I'm unmuted, Joe, and, and uh, I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Yes. Okay, well, um, until we get Renata Nicolai from the Commission sorted out, maybe you could give us a few minutes of your thought on how on how civil society... Thank you uh, very much. Uh, oh, yes, thank Renata you very much, Joe. Room. Thank you very much for having me. Go ahead, Renata. We lost you there for a moment. You go ahead. The floor is yours. Oh dear, we're having technical problems with Renata again. Okay, if we could uh, hold off on Renata and go back to Carl Dolan, who is standing by. Um, uh, Carl, you've got a few minutes now until we get Renata's technical issues sorted out. Thank you very much, Joe. My name is uh, Carl Dolan. I'm the uh, Deputy Director and Head of Advocacy at the Open Society European Policy Institute, uh, the Brussels arm of the Open Society Foundations. And in some ways, the development of our office mirrors the sad fate of the rule of law in the EU, because when we first started our operations uh, over a decade ago, we were almost exclusive, exclusively focused on government accountability, the rule of law, the protection of fundamental rights outside the EU's borders. And in the last five years, we now have a dedicated team with uh, an exclusive focus on the rule of law and fundamental rights within the EU's borders. So, of course, what's happened since then is that we've had the financial and euro crises, which have turbocharged populist politics from Spain to Estonia, from Greece to Sweden. And all of that has put the norms and institutions of liberal democracy under strain, even in countries that are supposed standard bearers of the rule of law, such as uh, the UK. So that all of that points to the necessity of the Commission upgrading its rule of law toolbox. Uh, and we should really give kudos to the Commission on how far it has come over the last five years. And, and Renata will, will go into a little bit more detail on that when she, when she speaks. But basically, in summary, it has moved from uh, nothing more than dialogue and a few dormant treaty articles to an impressive array of instruments, uh, including uh, culminating in this month's groundbreaking agreement on linking EU funding to respect uh, for the rule of law. But having a well-stocked toolbox is one thing, actually fixing the EU's growing rule of law crisis is another, because no one would argue that the situation on the ground is getting better. If anything, the situation in Hungary and Poland gets worse day by day, month by month. In Hungary, just last week, the descent into autocracy continues with proposed changes to the electoral law that will prevent the opposition from fielding common candidates in the 2022 elections, a tactic that, when it was used in local elections in 2018, helped opposition parties regain control of Budapest and other major cities. In Poland, you've seen a politically appointed constitutional court uh, start to roll back fundamental rights, such as a woman's right to choose, and I'm sure uh, Claire on the panel will have more to say about that uh, later on. But perhaps one of the biggest worries is in uh, the neglected uh, member state of Slovenia. Its current prime minister, Janusz Jansa, Jansa, was previously famous for serving time in prison for corruption offences, but has recently been catapulted to fame by virtue of being the only world leader to congratulate Donald Trump for winning the US presidential election. Since regaining power in Slovenia earlier this year, he has attacked the independent state media, used COVID emergency powers to subvert the rule of law, and launched attacks on cultural institutions and independent civil society, most recently evicting um, Open Society Foundation's organization in Ljubljana, the Slovenian Peace Institute, from its government-owned buildings at the height of the current lockdown. Now, this is worrying for, this is the canary in the coal mine for two reasons. Slovenia was previously a poster boy for the successful transition to democracy that Central and East European states used to aspire to. And the fact that it has gone off the rails so dramatically in such a short space of time is testimony to the very real, very damaging contagion effect from elsewhere in the region. Secondly, Slovenia gets a largely glowing assessment in the Commission's rule of law report that it published in September. Now, if that report can't act as an early warning system for these kinds of political de developments, then that does undermine the credibility and usefulness of that otherwise very worthwhile exercise. So what can the EU do to combat this other contagion that is ravaging the continent? Well, first of all, it needs to stop creating any more instruments. It now has all the tools that it needs and the focus, the relentless focus needs to be on implementation, implementation, implementation. It needs to bring the two outstanding Article 7 proceedings against Hungary and Poland to conclusion with either the ultimate sanction or a clear timetable for reform. It needs to ensure that the legal wins that the Commission has had, for example, 
in overturning Hungary's restrictions on foreign funding for NGOs, that these are enforced. It cannot stand for a situation, as is the case recently, where Hungarian NGOs are refused EU funding, which is classified as foreign funding, because they are branded foreign funded NGOs, even after that law has been voided by the European Court of Justice. And of course, the new conditionality instrument that uh, was agreed last week must be used, and there are already grounds for it to be used, and its existence on paper will not be sufficient uh, as a deterrent. And I can say more about that in the Q&A. And my final point, because I know there are representatives of the business community in the audience here, um, is about the role of business. There are obvious limits to what any technocratic institution can do to effectively re-democratize some of its member states. And the role of civil society is frequently invoked in this, right? But we rarely pay attention to business when it comes to the rule of law. And when we do, it is usually as the victim. But there is no doubt that the influence of some companies in this region probably far exceeds that of the European Commission and other institutions. German car companies, for example, and their suppliers account for approximately 10% of the GDP in Hungary and 5% of Hungarian jobs. Now imagine what might happen if the executives of these companies made it known that their continued investment in the country was dependent on their confidence in the rule of law and democratic institutions. Now this might seem far-fetched, especially as German car companies benefit disproportionately from public subsidies in Hungary. But if those companies can be made to understand their role in precipitating, precipitating the climate crisis and to change their ways and investment strategies due to sustained public pressure, why can they not also be made to acknowledge their moral responsibilities as regards the EU's ongoing rule of law crisis? Now I'll stop there, but uh, I'm sure there's lots to come back to in the Q&A and further discussion. Carl, okay. Carl, thank you much for that. Uh, we're still sorting out uh, Renata Nicolai's line uh, from the European Commission. We will come to Renata. That will only take a few more minutes. In the meantime, I'd like to invite uh, Claire uh, Fossons to join us from uh, the, the women's lobby to express her thoughts on this issue of the rule of law. Claire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting the voice of TV society in this uh, in this very important discussion. So I'm Claire Forsons. Um, I'm policy and campaigns director at the European Women's Lobby. The European Women's Lobby is the largest umbrella organization of women's organization in Europe. We have members um, in all EU countries, including in EU candidate countries. Um, so we at EWL work to progress women's rights since 30 years, since our creation. And there's no doubt that beyond us, uh, women and women's organization are contributing greatly to the democracy and to the rule of law. We have seen lately very good examples out, just outside of our borders uh, with women in Belarus really fighting for their democratic rights. And also, as uh, my colleague Carl just mentioned, we have seen women in Poland lately uh, protesting against the decision of the Constitutional Court to limit their rights to access abortion. So it's really clear that women's organization and women's movement are, are important to counter uh, the difficult times we are in. Um, we usually call about a backlash in women's rights in some regions of, of the EU. And actually, our members from uh, Central Europe, the Balkans and the Baltics have come together lately to, to raise the alarm and explain why this situation has, has, um, has become worse for, for women's rights and how much it is important to support them um, from, from outside of those countries to make sure that women's access to economic life is not uh, reduced and also that they have access to representation in parliaments in particular. Uh, we have seen that in between uh, the communist era and, and just after the, the, the fall of the wall, the number of women's parliamentarians in Romania, for example, went down from 30% to 3% and from 33% to 7% in Hungary. So this is really of great concern. It's even more of concern that we have seen lately uh, with the pandemic, with the COVID-19 pandemics, really a stress to um, women's rights and to equality. We have unfortunately noted um, in many EU countries a rise in violence against women and girls in lo lockdown situations. And uh, for sure, as we are getting more and more online, as, as we do today, uh, we will probably see an increase in online violence against women and girls 
And this is particularly worrying in terms of democratic rights, because we know that women politicians are particularly targeted through online platforms, through social media. We know that half of them have already received death threats, rape threats, uh, beating threats through social media platform, or also that have been they have been targeted through online sexist attacks on social networks. This is particularly worrying because this is actually pushing women to leave the politi political life and to get out of uh, the much needed representation uh, uh, within electoral uh, mandates. Um, so we absolutely need to create an online safe space. Uh, for women, for, for everyone, to ensure that we have women's representation in decision-making. Um, in terms of what the European Commission and the EU can do to help improve women's rights in the EU, there are plenty of tools at the disposal uh, of the EU, and we are really calling on uh, the European Commission to, to take, uh, to embrace those tools. We know that equality between women and men is uh, a core value of the EU. It is in the treaties. The treaties are also clearly stating that uh, all policies of the EU should have, uh, should pursue the objective of equality between women and men. So we are, we, we think that there, there are tools at the disposal and the mandate for, for the EU to, to do this job. Uh, and actually, the gender equality strategy that has been launched by the Commission last March, just before uh, the, the breakdown, uh, the breakout of the pandemic, uh, is really important. is is going to be really important to implement it, not only at the EU level but also at the national level. Um, and we really want to keep pushing uh, the EU to 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 have countries in the EU. Uh, to ratify the Istanbul Convention. I was mentioning just before uh, the raise in violence against women and girls. This instrument is the best instrument we have at hand to ensure women are protected against violence against, uh, um, um, against women and girls. And as, we, as I just said, this is important to protect them from this fear of being uh, uh, of violence and because it's necessary for them to express in, in all spheres of life. Um, so we really want the EU to to, take, to embrace this issue, to uh, to even propose a directive uh, to tackle all forms of violence against women and girls. Also, as uh, the the talk of the town now is of course on on on, on funding and support to civil society organization in particular uh, from the EU, um, we are really uh, we have been really welcoming the latest. Um, result of the negotiation between the European Parliament and the Council and, and, and the raise, uh, the increase of funds that would go to equality between women and men and the support to women's organization. We believe this is really important to strengthen those funding to support women's organization in the countries. And indeed, if the condition, conditionality of dispersing this funding to certain countries um, conditionality of them respecting women's rights is really important. We want to also add that this shouldn't be to the detriment of women's rights organization on the ground, the grassroots organization who desperately need this support, this funding support from, from the EU and external uh, funders. Um, so again, we believe there are a, a wide range of tools at the disposal of the of the European Commission and the EU, and we would really call them to to continue championing women's rights to ensure uh, the rule of law and democracy is uh, respected throughout the EU. Uh, I'm happy to develop further in in any questions. Thank you very much. Um, the European Women's Lobby. Thank you for your thoughts. We will be coming back to a lot of those issues, no doubt. I'm going to bring in the voice of business now, hopefully the voice of reason as well. Mark Alexander Friedrich, who's the head of international affairs at Metro AG. Uh, uh, Mark, you've got a few minutes to tell us where business views this issue of the rule of law. Certainly, Carl made reference to it in his discussion a few minutes ago as well. Mark. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I would maybe start off with uh, why rule of law matters in the first place for companies. Because clearly, um, if you make an investment, it's a long-term term planning. And uh, for this, we are aiming for predictable investment climates. And well, we want to calculate the return on investments. So obviously, uh, being able to rely, for example, on courts uh, to, um, to challenge uh, subjective uh, decisions by the government or 
or direct attacks on by by people who have uh, who might have business interests in the in the environment of the government is crucial. That's why it matters to us to to have a uh, rule of law and to rely on it. Um, of course, legal changes they occur all the time. Um, however, we want to be involved. We want to talk with the governments. We want to have uh, meaningful consultation procedures. And there, we saw often that uh, in many cases these consultation procedures were reduced to to a mere formality, where it was pretty much just about ticking off a box that. Um, uh, that governments did a consultation procedure, but they were not really interested in the position of stakeholders. Um, and ultimately, we believe that uh, where rule of law is respected, living conditions are better, which means that it uh, attracts educated people, it makes them stay in the country, and also makes people move their uh, enriching societies. So as an investor, also we are looking uh, at locations with, with strong rule of law because we think that there we can attract the best people. So that brings me to the question of what companies can actually do to defend rule of law. And uh, yes, um, Carl um, mentioned the, the role of business. Uh, one has to understand the dilemma in which companies are, because of course, in the first place, uh, we are responsible for our investors, our stakeholders, and uh, for our employees in some countries, thankfully not in the European Union. Uh, openly criticizing or attacking governments can also mean a risk to employees. So this balancing act always one has to keep in mind when, when calling on companies uh, to get involved. Um, nevertheless, uh, we believe that uh, that once rule of law is in place and strong, uh, as mentioned before, uh, legislative political interest representation becomes easier and it's easier to talk to governments. Um, However, with all this said, um, it, it is uh, important to say that the role of companies is also changing. Um, increasingly, companies are becoming corporate citizens. Uh, so, um, for example, if you look at the concept of responsible finance uh, and the demands to position ourselves on social issues, investors, employees, um, and also society expects us to take a stand. Uh, recently in October, there was a Edelman study that showed that 73% of employees uh, expect their companies to uh, be more outspoken and to drive towards change in society. So I think there is also a change happening there. Um, so yeah, what we see here is this need for a balancing act. Um, at the one hand, uh, representing our business interests, and on the other hand, uh, working towards a desired stable uh, environment. Now, um, a few sectors were mentioned earlier by Carl. Um, I have to say the situation of the retail and the wholesale sector in the mentioned country is, uh, has been quite different over the past few years. Um, there were more or less open attacks uh, on, um, on the sector, uh, blaming the sector for um, alleged uh, unfair treatments uh, or, or withdrawing money from the countries, which factually, if you check the facts, uh, simply is not true. Um, so, in this situation for a long time, uh, we saw that the European Commission's interventions worked as a meaningful deterrent. However, um, over the past years, uh, the member states have increasingly learned how to circumvent these things. So, on a long run, we, we think that uh, we profit from rule of law, that we need to work together uh, with the European Commission, with member states, uh, to overcome such arbitrary uh, actions. This is why we point such issues out to the European Commission, to our member states, uh, but we also uh, expect that the institutions become more or less toothless um, in challenging uh, such, well, sometimes almost salami tactics that are applied with taking little bits of um, the um, of the rule of law in these countries and um, and attacking certain actors step by step. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for that. I, I'm going to stay with you, Mark, uh, uh, from Metro, if I may. Um, you mentioned the word toothless. and uh, We don't have Renata yet to put that directly to her. We will in a few minutes. Do you think the European Commission has been toothless when it comes to the application of the rule of law throughout the European Union? Uh, I think um, what I mentioned that, especially a few years ago, I mean, we are, um, we, entered, for example, looking at the Central Eastern European markets, we entered them in the early 90s. Um, 
so uh, long before it became a part of the European Union. Now, um, in the beginning, when it was about joining the European Union and when these member states were new in the European Union, then a letter from the European Commission could make a huge difference uh, when it was about violations of, of internal market principles, for example. However, what we have seen since then is that these member states have, uh, now I have a strong echo here, I don't know if someone could mute it. Um, what, what we increasingly see is that uh, member states uh, know how to, how to find their path along uh, within the um, institutional framework or the legal framework of the European Union. For example, what the, uh, what the Commission can do very well is uh, attack a company, a company, a member state, uh, when it comes to state aid, then they can pretty much stop actions by the government on the spot. But, consul uh, but notification procedures pretty much don't lead anywhere. Infringement pr procedures often take several years, uh, and pretty much uh, there is there are facts set on the ground before something really is being changed. And this is a this is a very worrying uh, situation, and that's what I mean by by, by toothless in many uh, many situations. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that. Um, I'm hopefully going to go to Renata Nicolai from uh, the, the Commission. Give me a wave, Nicol uh, Renata, if you can hear me. Um, in the, I'm going to, I'm going to, I can hear you very well. Great. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to remind you all out there to contribute your questions. Don't forget, don't forget hashtag WSBRU for your Twitter comments or Facebook comments. But also, if you want to put a question, use the Slido facility on the right-hand side of your screen. We've already had a few questions in. I will be coming to them in due course, but let's go to the video, video of the verb because uh, the commission has been mentioned a few times. So with, uh, with bated breath and fingers crossed uh, for technical reasons, I'm going to cross now to Renate Nicolai, the chef de cabinet at uh, Commissioner mm -hmm. Europa's cabinet. Thank you so much for having me and sorry about a hiccup uh, on the technical side. Um, uh, I would like to kind of, you know, uh, bring in uh, a, a rather positive message of hope today because I would really try to describe 2020 as a game changing year on rule of law matters in the EU. It's of course not uh, that we are only discovering the rule of law as an important uh, topic this year. We've been dealing with that with more over more than a decade. I mean, starting with the CBMs, the European semester, the country specific recommendations, our justice scoreboard, infringement, and so, and so on. But this year is a game changer because we are really coming with, you know, very innovative new tools to have an effective prevention of rule of law issues, but also to increase our effective response on rule of law matters. And why is this so important? Because rule of law is really not only the legal foundation of our union, it's also the key foundation for an effective single market, because without rule of law, you will not have mutual trust. You will have hiccups in uh, dealing with um, effective judicial cooperation matters, such as European arrest warrants and so on. So what's new this year? Um, I would like to stress two points. The one is that for the first time we are present, we have presented a, a rule of law report that covers all 27 member states. This was desperately needed because in order to kind of promote and to reconfirm a rule of law culture in the EU, we need to better understand what we are talking about. We need to better understand the situations in all member states. Um, and what this rule of law report has also shown that there are issues not only in one or two member states, but there are issues in pretty much every member state. And what we also have done with this rule of law report is kind of opening uh, the rule of law debate to a really broad concept of rule of law. Of course, the independent and effective judiciary is a key part of it, but the framework to deal with corruption is another part. Media uh, diversity, media pluralism is an important part. And there are other checks and balances, for instance, the role of NGOs. This was a very cooperative exercise with the member states. It's a little bit like a European semester of rule of law. And this kind of, you know, cooperative tool in order to prevent things from becoming big problems, in order to allow us to really engage in a dialogue is so crucial at this time. We will have a general affairs council next week after the first presentation of the rule of, 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 of law report, which already went quite well in October. We will have a peer review exercise where five member states will be looked at 
product and their reports and there will be a discussion this we have never done in the past and that's really important in order to stabilize our rule of law debate um, in the eu but as important is the other part that i wanted to talk about and that's the effective response here of course we will as the european commission continue to play our our uh, role as guardians of the treaty we will continue to work well with the european court of justice on infringement matters um, when uh, we have a rule of law issue that can become can be brought to an infringement we have done a lot um, in the last couple of years we had decisive decisions from the european court of justice to clarify criteria for independent judiciary uh, but also value-based infringements uh, like in the cases of ngos or the central european university in the cases of hungary they are all important but as i said not all rule of law matters can be dealt with there that's why the MFF rule of law conditionality deal that has been brokered uh, in the trilogues recently is so important to add to an effective response. Here we're talking about securing the EU financial interest. We owe this to EU taxpayers. Uh, we need to ensure that you know we're spending a lot of money and with next generation EU, much more money than we have ever spent. And we need to ensure that there are systems in, play, in place to really protect that. And if you don't have an independent judiciary, if you're not not having a prosecutor's office that works well, then you cannot ensure that. So we are very, very happy with this result. You might know that we have uh, invented this idea from the outset. And at the time, people were not sure it would ever work. Um, and I really, really hope that we will see uh, the fruition of this and that the co-legislators will be able uh, to adopt this. If we have this kind of approach, to have preventive tools, to allow for the dialogue, but also to have effective response tool. I am very hopeful that in a number of years, when we are coming to the end of this commission, we will be in a different place on rule of law matters in the EU, where we will all together have made progress on the difficult things, have facilitated a real dialogue on rule of law matters, and have reconfirmed our conviction and our common understanding on rule of law in the EU. Thank you so much. Renata, thank you very much. Um, the, the timing for this discussion is very important. Uh, we already referred to the agreement of the European Parliament in the last few days, but only in the last two days, we've heard from Budapest and from Warsaw uh, rejecting the idea of attaching conditions to money, bailout money, COVID-19 money and the entire new budget for the next seven years for the entire European Union. Can I come back to you, Renata, and say what happens if Viktor Orban in Hungary decides, no, I will not agree to this, I will veto this. Can he veto this? And how does the EU get around this problem? As you know very well, the EU is built on kind of cooperation with member states. And as you also know very well, an MFF deal can only be done with the support of all member states. However, my hope remains that, you know, in further discussing the concrete outcome of this trilogue on MFF, including the MFF rule of law conditionality, in explaining clearly that what might, you know, be one of the, the reasons of concerns in Hungary and in Poland, that there are not clear enough criteria, that the procedure is not clear enough, uh, that they will not have a say as, as, a, as a member state if ever there was an issue uh, that had to do with their member state. I think we can clarify this further. Um, uh, I think that the outcome of the trilogue um, is really offering a very good compromise. We came from very different positions in the Council and the Parliament, um, and, and uh, you know we are coming closer to the Commission proposal as we have originally proposed it in 2018. There are really assurances built in uh, for all partners, um, and I think I really really hope that we can convince everybody um, to support this. The money of the MFF and of next generation EU is badly needed in all member states, including in Poland and Hungary. So I hope that wisdom will prevail on that and that we can help give it a helping hand with further clarifications from our side. Thank you very much. Can I bring in um, Carl, Carl Dolan? Um, Carl, could you see a situation whereby the Hungarians and the Poles block the entire disbursement of COVID-19 rescue money. And a second question for you, and I'll put that to the others as well. Could those countries who agree with the rule of law conditionality, could they go around this by having an intergovernmental agreement or intergovernmental treaty? 
Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, well, of course, looking at this from the standpoint of a rational actor, you would have to say that Orban and and, uh, and others are, are bluffing, right? Because uh, as Renata pointed out, they need the money as, as much, probably more than many other member states. Uh, Hungary's uh, GDP is, is going to contract by about 7% this year. Uh, its deficit is now five times bigger than it was at the start of the crisis. Uh, they need this recovery fund and they need this recovery fund badly. Uh, but maybe we're not dealing with a rational actor here. And actually recent events would suggest that the assumption that they were dealing with rational actors doesn't stand up. So I, I think there is a scenario uh, it's 2020, after all, uh, where uh, he does hold up uh, the ratification of the own resources part of the um, budget. But remember, it's, it's only the own resources part, the bit which allows the Commission to pay back the debt uh, that it will incur. That's what they, they um, can hold up. So I, I would suggest if we could somehow de-link until this is sorted out, is sorted out the, the, the ratification from the delivery of the recovery package, that might help. You mentioned an, an interinstitutional agreement. That was what happened in the early stages of the, uh, the euro crisis as well. The, the oh dear, have we lost Carl? Okay, I fear Carl is frozen for the moment. So let's go to Claire, um, Claire Forson. Um, Claire, I hope you're listening to that. Are you worried that, uh, or, or are you? Do you agree with Carl that it's a bluff from Warsaw and Budapest? Um, I, I can't really judge if it's a bluff or not. I mean, I'm, I'm not in, in their shoes. Uh, I think they are pretty serious, actually, in terms of women's rights so far. Uh, so I'm talking from, from uh, our perspective, the perspective of the European Women's Lobby. Like, it's clear that they are really acting against uh, women's rights and really want to have women return home. So that's, that's not uh, bluffing. That's uh, reality on the ground from our members and women's organizations there. Um, so what I, I'd like to really raise and, and, and uh, one everybody, every actor here on is um, that this whole discussion, this whole battle about the funding, uh, that it doesn't have a, a detrimental effect, effect on women and women's organization on the ground in Hungary and in Poland, because at the end of the day, uh, those so-called indirect sanctions, in a way, uh, could have a detrimental effect on those who are fighting for the rule of law in the countries. So um, obviously that's a, a difficult mechanism and probably very um, specific mechanism that needs to be put in place to ensure um, that they are not paying the price, that women and, and civil society actors in general don't pay the price for, for this whole battle, because it would make the situation even worse for them and for uh, those whose rights are... Um, okay, thank you very much, Claire, for that. Can I bring in Mark Alexander Friedrich from Metro on this one? Um, you spoke about companies need to have certainty. And they love the rule of law because they know that they're investing in long term contracts, which will be upheld by courts. Let me put it the other way around. Surely the priority for business is to stay in business, to make a little bit of profit or a lot of profit. And that for companies, I'm not saying Metro, but for most companies, the idea is to make money and they don't really care how the government is run. Uh, I'm thinking of China, of course. Um, a very large car, a German car maker, is making cars in the Xinjiang region, where the Uyghur population have been treated quite badly uh, by uh, Beijing. So let me just put it to you, and I know it's unfair that you are the voice of business and there are thousands of companies all over Europe, but profit will trump ethics. Um. Um, before answering that, that question, I would quickly like to say something about uh, about the aid fund for, for Corona, because um, from a business perspective, we see it with our, our customers, uh, independent restaurants, um, Horeca, so really businesses that are very much affected by the current crisis. It would be a horrible, horrible development for them if uh, we were to... Um, postpone the, uh, the payments from the EU fund over a longer period of time. Many of those businesses and also existences would uh, would break over this. So um, 
from from the business perspective to, to say something about that and it's not my job to evaluate whether whether Orban or Morawiecki uh, are bluffing or not um, but uh, but it would be a very very negative development and uh, this this needs to be taken account uh, about the making profit of course this is this is the, the dilemma that that businesses are are in to a certain extent uh, I mean our situation in Central Eastern Europe I mentioned that that over the past few years we have uh, faced a certain well series of attacks by by laws that from our point of view and also from the point of view of the Commission and of the courts uh, regularly violated the principles of the internal market. Nevertheless, we stayed in those markets because the economy was developing positively. And after all, uh, it was about staying there, uh, staying in the business or withdrawing fully and losing your investment. So um, th th this is the di dilemma we're in. Thankfully, uh, we are not in a, in a situation uh, where, it, where it comes to as extreme cases as you mentioned in your, in your question. Uh, and I think that is also a line uh, that, that business has to draw uh, clearly when, when it comes to, to such massive human rights violations. Uh, we look into our supply chain. We, we try to track uh, every, everything as well as we can and as best as we can in order to, to avoid such issues simply because it is crucial for for our business, for our reliability as a, as a business partner uh, to, to stick to these clear principles. Thank you very much, Mark. Let me go back to Renata Nicolai from the European Commission. Uh, I know you probably have some thoughts on what Claire Forsan said and how women have been ostracized and driven out of politics in some countries, especially in Eastern Europe. But also maybe you could address this idea of the role of business, the role of companies when it comes to the law in questionable nations. Thank you. And indeed, I'm very happy to kind of, you know, come back to the very important point that Claire also made just now on the MFF rule of law, conditionality and uh, the fact that we shouldn't kind of sanction the beneficiaries of EU money with that. And just to assure you that in the final kind of text, there are real safeguards because the way it works with the European money is that the contracts are done with the member state. And then the money comes in to kind of, you know, support the member state. So what we might have made clear that the obligations of the member states will continue to exist. Uh, it's just that the European money would, uh, you know, probably not come in. And then also there will be, of course, um, if ever we were to apply such a case, we would have to have a, we, we would have a choice of what kind of money to select. And for sure, we would, you know, be look very, very hard not to kind of damage the kind of the, the vibrant the civil society, the Erasmus money or things like that. So, uh, but just to, to, to make that clear, uh, I think you made very important points on the situation of women uh, in some of our member states. Uh, we have been working with um, Vice President Jourova a lot on that already in the last mandate. Uh, the issues of violence against women, uh, the, the political participation of women, uh, the backtracking that we saw um, or we are still seeing in, in member states. Um, I mean, I think what I can give you as a, a clear kind of, you know, commitments from this commission, also from the von der Leyen Commission, which is a much more kind of, you know, gender-based commission compared to uh, any other commission in the past, um, that there is a real dedication um, of people like Vice President Eurobar, Commissioner Dali, to advance this agenda, um, uh, the equality agenda. I mean, we've just done an LGBTIQ strategy yesterday. I mean, we are very committed to kind of, you know, doing these kind of things. We will come up with a legislative proposal on violence against women. Um, we will kind of uh, work on a legislative proposal on pay transparency. So we will continue to uh, do what we can do in terms of our competence uh, to advance the legislative kind of context. But of course, we will also not shy away from uh, making our voice very loudly he heard uh, when we see backtracking. On the role of business, this is so important and I'm so happy that we have a business representative here with us. Um, what is very often the case when we are, when we were still traveling, <laughs> uh, when we are in member states and when we kind of, you know, do not only discuss with the government representatives, but we also have, as you can imagine, uh, roundtables with business 
Um, in, under Chatham House rules, uh, they all say how important a secure investment environment is. And for a secure investment environment, you need a strong and efficient rule of law structure, a strong and efficient judiciary. Uh, on the other hand, you know, people are there to do business. Um, and uh, so I'm very happy that we've also on the business side moved on. And we have today in this kind of panel uh, a clear statement from a business um, uh, representative on record. Uh, supporting that you know rule of law matters are not only legal matters they are also economic matters they are matters that that are cru of crucial importance as i said in my introductory statement for the efficient work um, and and working together in the in the single market so i think there is a role we want to facilitate business that's what the european project is also about but we are we are we are kind of you know um uh, really uh we, we have to kind of facilitate this mutual kind of trust in each other's system and that also has an, has a bearing on the economic context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renata. I'm going to come to Carl in a moment, but I'm going to read out some comments that we've had uh, from you guys out there, uh, people who have uh, submitted their questions via Slido uh, or commented using the hashtag WSBRU. Uh, Rita Giannini, policy advisor in the Brussels office of the United Kingdom, you forgot lawyers. The role of lawyers in upholding the rule of law is fundamental, and there have been comments attacking quote, lefty lawyers in Britain and lawyers being jailed in Turkey. A uh, comment from Friedrich Tieda Merlo, who's a consultant with Project Associates. Any thoughts on the democratic backsliding in Georgia? I presume that's the country rather than the state, which is still being counted in the United States, uh, especially judicial independence and the blurring of party and state in uh, disputes with opponents. Carl, do you have any thoughts on that? Carl Dolan um, from Open Society Europe. Um, well, I think that there's some very interesting points there. I mean, I, I, and I would uh, offer that up to other panelists as well, but I do want to come back to something that both uh, that Renate and, uh, and uh, Friedrich had said, which is about the role of business here, because uh, this is not only a legal issue, true, it's an economic issue, but it's not only an economic issue, and it's maybe first and foremost an issue of values, because even if, of course, businesses look for predictability, uh, and often they find that predictability in the rule of law, but there are other ways that countries can provide that uh, predictability, and there are also autocracies like Singapore, for example, that do provide that predictability, but they are not in line with our values. So I think it's about uh, companies need to, to think about, as they have done with climate change, about how they need to change and adapt in line with other values apart from the economic and profit motive. Uh, and in that way, align also, I would say, with their consumers, with their employees, and, and with citizens elsewhere. Um, but uh, so I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very important point to make. And I, I, I hope that more and more companies will take that line and come out of the public record on that in the EU as well. Um, Claire, are, 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 what do you think about this issue about companies doing more, uh, not just on, uh, on women's issues, but should companies be more vocal when it comes to the rule of law? Should they stand up to those governments or should they perhaps even withdraw from those economies? Well, I believe that companies, as any actors in society, have a role to play to ensure democracy and the rule of law. Uh, I'm going to take an example, which is uh, obviously from the women's rights perspective. Um, we have studied that in countries where companies have uh, ensure equal representation of women in their boards, boards of director, that it had a good effect on the society in general, that really like this business driven initiative, uh, was really um, improving the representation of women in businesses. And uh, so, I'm, I, I'm, 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 of course, this needs to go with some legal actions. And we have uh, pending since a few years at the EU level, the Women on Boards Directive, which uh, we hope uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be reopened soon. Um, so, of course, we need legal action, but business can really set the scene for improvement for women's rights in this in this situation. And of course, uh, we had also lately a great win at the EU level with the work-life balance directives. This is also in the field of, of, of work and, and how women can access the, the labor market. Um, so all of that needs to be put in place, obviously, 
uh, with uh, business actors. And as uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Nicolai was, uh, was just mentioning, we have a pre transparency proposal coming up soon. And we are, we are really hoping that business will be supporting and really will take their share in implementing this, uh, this proposal because this is only if they take part and if they really truly embrace the need to have access to all the salaries of all their employees that we will be able, that women will be able to, to fight for their rights for equal salaries. So just uh, that's just a, a set of, of quick examples on how business can, can really help um, women's rights and I think rights in general. Thank you. Um, thank you, Claire. And I will put that to Mark uh, in due course. Uh, Renata Nicolai wanted to come in on the uh, Georgia question. But also while I have you, Renata, let me put a big question to you. Is it even right that an organization like the EU tells a sovereign nation what it should do? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, let me get back to the to the uh, to the question of, that came from the audience. Uh, lawyers, uh, the role of lawyers, are very well understood. And if you read the rule of law report, that is also referred to. So just uh, just to make that point on Georgia, or you know, let's say our neighbourhood or our kind of you know external relations in what is a geopolitical commission, as uh, this commission is kind of also describing itself. Of course, you know, um, rule of law matters are of key importance when we are dealing uh, not only with, uh, you know, accession countries in the Balkans, but also with our immediate neighborhood in the east and in the south. And that's why, you know, it's so important to put our house in order so that we can actually be a credible actor also when, when we are dealing with, with our neighborhood. Uh, I don't have the, the, the kind of the latest on Georgia. I can only tell you that, um, you know, in the external relations context, um, uh, the, 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 the colleagues are, are very much following the developments um, in the electoral process. Uh, and there are very, very strong uh, relations uh, because of the Eastern partnership uh, with Georgia to kind of make sure that, uh, that also rule of law matters are dealt with. Now to Joe's question. Look, it's not, when we are dealing with rule of law matters, it's not about prescribing uh, to Spain, <laughs> to give you an example where we had a recent discussion on the rule of law potential issue, you know, coming up, how to deal with their judicial reform. Everybody is free to design their own national legal system because that's also the result of centuries of history of, uh, you know, the individual development of that respective nation. Um, so that's why the rule of law report, I'm coming back to that, is so important because we need to have a better understanding. Everybody in this debate, uh, wherever you are, whether you are a stakeholder out, whether you're a parliament, whether you're council, whether you're commission, we need a much better understanding of what we're talking about. National judicial councils do not exist in all member states and we will not order them. We have to take into account the, the, the diversity. But what is important is that we agree on the, the, the principal matters of checks and balances in the EU. Because without these principal matters, we will never fulfill Article 2 of the treaty. So we are not kind of, you know, trespassing into the sovereign decisions of member states. We are only filling with life what all member states have abided by when they joined the European Union project uh, with the principles of Article 2. So I think that's the answer to your question, Joe. Thank you very much, Renata. Let's go to, let's go to Dolan. A uh, question we got in from an audio member of Papa asking about the role of the giant internet forums, forums Google, Facebook, etc., Twitter, but also the Chinese ones, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, etc. They have allowed the spread of strong views, some view throughout their platforms and have uh, a lack of information throughout their platforms. What role should they play? And I'll put the same question to Mark uh, as well from Metro. Carl. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the role of, uh, I mean, most of our political discourse is going online and on these platforms now, right? So uh, the, the, the health of our democracy is inseparable from the role that these platforms play. Uh, so there's no doubt, and, you know, uh, grantees of ours have been victims of this, uh, that they are, are, are doing too little 
to stop uh, hate speech, to, to stop the spread of misinformation and other social harms. Uh, the, the list is endless. Uh, so that needs to be tackled. Self-regulation hasn't worked. Um, but we've only seen recently with Facebook, for example, where uh, one law is applied to uh, so-called jihadi extremists, but when it's Steve Bannon and who's providing lots of uh, advertising revenue to Facebook, uh, uh, their protocols and their rules uh, do not apply. So uh, I'm very I'm looking forward to in December the, uh, the the regulation that will be coming out of the European Commission on this. You know, I think we, it's a very careful line to tread because we 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 also need to you know, we don't give, need to give these companies any more power to censor uh, 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 our free speech online. Uh, but uh, need to be regulated very carefully. Okay, let me put the same question to Mark Alexander Friedrich from Metro from a business perspective. Are you worried about the spread of disinformation which might lead to a weakening of democracy and transparency in Europe? Um, of course, I mean, also... I'm a, I'm a citizen as well uh, in the first place, and when I see uh, the, the degree of fake news um, being put out via these um, these platforms in the past years, uh, it, it is worrying for me as a citizen, but also from a company's perspective, uh, such um, well wide range of uh, of um, inadequate news uh, being out there uh, is is again a risk and, and companies don't rise like, like risks because uh, it can easily build up uh, stories around fake news we have uh, also as a company seen well shit storms uh, about that's a issues technical that term we not sorry related about that. to uh, simply that's a very very <laughs> technical term I, I didn't know a better one <laughs> um, no, about uh, about issues uh, that were not in our hands. But we, we, we were uh, attacked on social media for uh, for issues that we were not in, involved in. So of course, uh, a way of creating level uh, playing field, a form of control or at least self control that is reliable um, is also important for business. Um, I think Twitter, for example, has stepped forward in little steps uh, recently. Um, Facebook, we have to see. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, we, we've only got, unfortunately, three minutes left, so I'm going to have to go around the tour de table to get a view on this, and we'll finish with Renata. I'd like to go to Claire, um, Claire Forsons now, to her final thoughts on, do you think these latest proposals from the EU, from Parliament, from Commission, etc., will work, and that the rule of law will be strengthened, especially in Eastern Europe? Briefly, please. Yes, I, I mean, I'm full of hope. I, I, I think we need to be full of hope. That's that the only uh, road we have anyway. So I think we need to, to fight for our values and fight for, for, for rights. That's uh, um, really, as, as Renate was saying, that this is uh, the essence of the European project and we shouldn't just drop it. And just to go back on, on the role of the online platforms we just mentioned before, uh, I think it's really important that the European Commission um, put the giants in front of their responsibility. And that's really important for, for because of the spread of online violence against women, as I said, against women politicians on social media platforms. So that's really an important topic to, to act on. Merci, merci, Claire. Thank you very much. Yeah. Carl, your, your final thoughts on whether these proposals will work. And I'm going to press you on. Please don't say, I hope so. No, I, I think they will be work. I think there's been a decisive uh, shift in mindset the European Commission and other institutions. They know that the fate of the European Union actually is wrapped up dealing with this issue. And I think uh, it's not the case that the Europe Commission has been toothless. It just needs to bite. Well, do you know what? I've just realized that um, the session goes on a bit longer than I thought. We've got a, we've got a time uh, to, um, to continue with the session. My mistake. So you didn't need to rush that answer, which means I can come to the uh, message from, uh, from Case Lanting, who posted the message. He's a senior consultant with Datsa Belgium. Uh, and the, his question is, would you agree that in decreasing order of importance, the priority should be one, rule of law, two, democracy, and three, religion? Carl. Uh, 
so this is slightly invidious question to, uh, uh, to, to sort of rank religion. Uh, so I, um, I think the, all of these issues are actually uh, wrapped up in each other, right? Uh, so what we're talking about essentially is uh, um, people's fundamental rights. Uh, and democracy and, and, and the rule of law, in a way, are, are, are um, ways of ma making sure that people can express their fundamental rights. One of those fundamental rights, of course, is their, their, their freedom to choose whatever religion they want. And, and so I, I think it's not a ranking. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, uh, it's a, it's a important ecosystem that we all have to nourish. My microphone was on mute. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Renata? The rule of law, democracy, and religion being the top three most important things or priorities. When we speak about the uh, portfolio of my vice president, it's called values and transparency. We always describe it with the triangle of rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. So for me, they are part of a triangle um, and that has to be balanced out all the time. Um, I think they are all on the radar and rightly so. Rule of law, we talked about that a lot. Um, and I think that's the most important message that there is no hiding anymore. There is no hiding between this is a national matter and the European Union has nothing to do with that. That's already a big achievement compared to where we were a couple of years ago. Democracy, we heard about, you know, the challenges, especially in our online reality on democracy. The platform's role was, was mentioned. We've tried things in the past. We will come early December with regulation. We will also come with a European Democracy Action Plan uh, because we have to distinguish, you know, this, between disinformation and illegal content. Illegal content we can take down. Disinformation we need to deal with as a society because we also need to protect the freedom of speech and fundamental rights. That's an internal struggle. We have to kind of, you know, always make sure that Europe is not a place of discrimination. And we saw with the Black Lives Matters, we see with anti-Semitic statements, we see with LGBTI free zones, that also on this, we have issues in Europe. So all three parts are really, really important and have to be worked on. Okay, can I ask you, while I have you, uh, Renata, um, why is it that it appears as if the rule of law and weakening democracy is an issue in Eastern Europe only. Now, I know there are issues in European countries, but it appears from the outside as if there are, there's a problem with former communist countries. I would be careful with that because I, I think we have to uh, acknowledge that you know the, the newer member states um, have have passed a, a very interesting phase in the last kind of you know decade and more. But of course, when you look at their specific history, they are relatively new democracies. And democracy is not a given. That's what we are all learning these days. Democracy has to be nurtured and has to be defended day by day. And what we see all, all around us, not only in Eastern European member states, we see a tendency to more autocratic kind of, you know, structures. And uh, we have to fend that off. Um, this is linked to our geostrategic and geopolitical context. Things were possible in the last years that I thought would never be possible in certain parts of the world. Um, and that's, we're not only talking about, you know, um, oligarch systems that we have dealt with for, for decades. Um, and I think that's the context we're dealing with. Uh, what is important is that in the EU, we acknowledge that this could happen everywhere. We have populist movements, not only in Eastern Europe, we have that also in founding kind of members of the European Union. So I wouldn't really want to contribute with this statement in, you know, confirming an East-West divide or whatever. The whole purpose of us doing this rule of law report this year was to show that there are issues in the EU and that there are things to reconfirm for us as a union, 27 together. And if you read the reports, there are issues in all member states. We are not only mentioning one or two. And I think that's the kind of, you know, it's a challenge that we have to deal with. It's not impossible to deal with it. 
it's about reconfirming, it's about adjusting our rules also to ensure that in an online environment, media, critical media can continue to play their role. There are a lot of, you know, challenges that we're better off if we work on that together. It's not about an East-West divide. Uh, and I know you're trying to be diplomatic, Renato, uh, given your role, of course, within the European, but in Western European countries where democracy is, is, is long established, uh, there, there are very few questions about the independence of the judiciary, whereas there are questions in Eastern Europe. Can I put the same question to Carl Dolan? Why do you think uh, it is mostly Eastern European countries? And of course, there are populist movements throughout the continent. But the issue of the independence of judiciary and the freedom of the press are issues mostly in Eastern Europe. Well, <laughs> it's a long, complicated history in Eastern Europe, and of course, the the, the uh, legacy of um, communism is part of it. The accession process is part of it. I think the um, uh, the, the, the 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 way that um, the, the financial crisis and the euro crisis hit this region. Uh, migration from the region has, has, has a large role to, to play with the, with the politics there. So there's a lot of factors at play there. But I, I don't accept this is just one um, issue, uh, just an issue for the for, for Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, look at the UK. I made reference to this, a brief reference to this in my opening remarks. I mean, what the Conservative Party in the in the uh, UK is contemplating now is straight from the Orban playbook. Uh, they're looking at curbs on the judiciary. They're not very happy with the Supreme Court because of what it did uh, uh, last year. Uh, on Brexit, uh, they're looking at they're attacking uh, the BBC, Joe, uh, and uh, looking and the, the, the main bastion of independent uh, journalism in the in the UK, uh, and they're also looking to put curbs on independent civil service. So this is this is a a worldwide trend, of course, uh, the US, Philippines, uh, uh, China, Russia, where all over the world, which is now uh, coming to every part of Europe, and that's why I was very glad to see the rule of law report, of course, and and. And hopefully seeing that some issues are flagged up in, well, I mean, the UK is left now. But, in, you know, in France, of course, some very worrying signals about uh, um, tolerance and respect for fundamental rights that are coming out precisely because of the emphasis on uh, anti-terrorism measures in those countries. So uh, I, I don't accept that this is uniquely an issue for Central and Eastern Europe. OK, um, I, I know, that Carl, you, you may need to uh, nip out uh, for a few minutes, uh, but before you do, um, Joe Biden. Joe Biden has won the U.S. presidential election. It hasn't been formally conceded yet by uh, President Trump. Um, do you think that is going to make a difference? And I say that because obviously President had a lot of friends, uh, in countries with issues with of law, most notably um, uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban. But also in Poland as well. I think that uh, President Biden from January the 20th onwards will send a very different signal. Um, I think I, I think that's that's true. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I think the symbolism of all this is very important. Uh, the political symbolism of all this, because there's no doubt that. Uh, um, certain political movements in the region and across Europe were looking at Trump as a, as a, as a standard bearer for their cause and as a sign that, you know, the tide of history had turned. And I think, you know, what we're seeing now is that, that that's not the case. It's just politics as usual. But I think the U.S. has also been very, 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 and in particular the Obama administration was very, very worried. I know from contacts that I had with the State Department at the time about uh, issues of rule of law and corruption in um, in Europe. And, and some of the most decisive action in, in, in Hungary was taken by the U.S. State Department, where they issued visa bans on uh, Hungarian officials, um, precisely because of their suspicion of, of being involved in corrupt deals with Russia uh, uh, around energy deals. So um, I, I think that kind of very aggressive action, which we saw under the Obama administration, uh, is likely to be uh, likely to happen again under a Biden administration. Mark, Mark Alexander Friedrich from Metro. Do you think an incoming President Joe Biden uh, administration will improve things for people who want more transparency, more democracy, and less erosion of democratic freedoms? 
Um, well, first of all, Metro is not present in the U.S., so of course we are we are following the the developments there, and I think they're also meaningful for us. But we are we are not that close uh, to to every step uh, that is happening there. What what we believe is that um, the tone will fundamentally change with the Biden presidency. Uh, the the way uh, the United States government will uh, act towards Europe and particularly Germany, and for for that matter. Uh, will be different. Uh, however, there are many issues that will remain, be it the NATO contributions, uh, presence in, in, in certain regions, uh, attitude towards China, uh, such matters. They will remain no matter who is the government there. So uh, it will be important to find, find common ground. But what I wanted to actually uh, come to is um, the earlier remarks about uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Uh, Yes, in many ways, uh, we had challenges from a business perspective in Eastern Europe. And yes, when it comes to courts, uh, there is a is a stronger um, lack of, of, of institutions in, in Eastern Europe. But no, it is not only an Eastern European issue. Uh, we see it when it comes to the internal market, which is uh, seen as uh, or is used as something good whenever it is to any nation's or member states' uh, advantage, but uh, not so much when it is to their disadvantage. Uh, for example, when we come to local uh, products and their promotion. Uh, so there is a general discourse that is going on uh, for many years about blaming Brussels, blaming blaming the others uh, for, for everything that goes wrong and taking the credit on the national level. And I think uh, as long as we do that also in Western European uh, member states, it will be very difficult uh, to really tackle the challenges in Eastern European member states because there is always the point of reference here, there you do it, there you do it, um, just looking at the number of infringements procedures against Germany at the moment. Thank you, um, thank you for that, Mark. Um, same question to you, Claire Fosson from uh, the European Women's Lobby. Uh, do you think things will change when it comes to the rule of law with a Joe Biden administration? Well, hopefully in the U.S., yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be surprising uh, anyone here when, when I say that uh, uh, the, the still current president wasn't really a champion of women's rights. Uh, so for sure, we will uh, see improvement for our colleagues in the U.S. and for all women in the, in the U.S. Uh, in terms of relationship with, uh, with the EU, um, I, I'm not sure to an extent that would have an impact on women's rights uh, and, and women on the ground here in the EU. And if I may also go back to uh, the previous question, as, as Friedrich uh, was doing, um, I think it's clear on women's rights, at least, that uh, there's, uh, there's no country in the EU where there's no inequalities between women and men. So. Uh, even if we might see a uh, situation that are worse in some countries and some champions uh, uh, in other countries, it's still a very, a very big issue everywhere. And just lately, the European Institute on Gender Equality uh, released its annual um, index. And again, it says that we are 60 years, e the EU at large, and as I was saying about online violence and how that impacts uh, women and in particular politician women. This is everywhere in the EU. This is not only uh, in the former communist countries, where maybe uh, there is particularly uh, a more worrying situation. Uh, very surprisingly, um, oh, I don't know if it's surprising actually, uh, but the fact that under communism, um, there was really an intention and a politic, a policy to um, ensure representation of women in the labor market and in elected um, institutions made that uh, as a reaction following the fall of the wall, uh, gender equality has been pushed back as a, a representation of the former communist system. Um, so in terms of uh, like there, we, have, we see really why uh, rights have been um, back going backwards instead of, of progressing. But again, um, the situation needs to be embraced uh, through the EU. So. Renata from uh, from the European Commission. I'm guessing there was a bottle of champagne or two opened uh, on Saturday uh, when Joe Biden's victory was uh, announced by the television networks. 
we were all, I think, glued to the television networks <laughs> to, to follow this uh, kind of process, of course. And uh, yes, I, I also don't kind of reveal secrets if I say that there is a lot of hope um, in, the, in the European institutions uh, that, you know, this uh, result of the elections can actually pave a way for a stronger uh, transatlantic cooperation. That's not going to be easy. Um, we have challenges on the US side. There has to be an agenda that works for the US at large. Um, so not all kind of, you know, uh, agenda that was dominating the Trump uh, campaign will go away because it will have to be covered by the Biden administration. But what we are hoping for is that our cooperation with uh, the future administration can be based on facts, on science, on values, on a, on a planning ahead. And this gives a lot of hope um, for important areas. And the area that I work on, for instance, the area of disinformation, I really see a possibility and democracy that we can also join forces in, um, you know, trying to kind of, you know, take steps in addressing the challenges of the digital transformation together, because uh, we are very tight together, economically tied together, uh, politically, uh, it would make a lot of sense to try uh, to move in a, in a similar direction. Thank you very much, Renata. Uh, before we go, I'm going to read out two two more comments uh, from people who they didn't give their name, um, but I'll just read them out, and then we can come to our closing arguments. Um, uh, from Anonymous, there have often been critical attitude towards Poland and Hungary, but never towards France and its discrimination of the yellow vest, the gilet jaune. Uh, we also have a comment, uh, Anonymous again, why FRG, which I presume is the Federal Republic of Germany, did not respect the protection of the Schengen border and fight against smuggling people and fight against international crime, including smuggling people. So I'm not sure whether that relates directly to to our rule of law issue, but their comments were just posted on our thing there. Um, is there anything else people want to add in before I, before I wind things up? Carl, did you have any final thoughts? Um, <clears throat> well, maybe just on, on, on those comments. I mean, I, I, I don't know if uh, there was anything particularly discriminatory, but there were concerns about excessive use of police violence and protests. Uh, and uh, other issues which would have um, been harmful for people's fundamental rights. And uh, it, this is, you know, goes with what I was saying earlier, which is that um, these issues are for every country. Now, uh, this shouldn't encourage a kind of um, whataboutism about the rule of law, right? And the, the Hungarian and Polish governments are very good at this. They, they uh, comparative constitutional law is one of their favorite pastimes. They, they take a piece of the legislation in France or, uh, or, or the UK or Spain or wherever and say, oh, it's a, it's a bit like ours, right? There's no doubt about it that you know um, Poland and Hungary are uh, now tottering on the on the on the tottering on the ledge, uh, and and and, and to, to, if other uh, organisations have already uh, categorised Hungary as effectively not a democracy anymore. So we, what we are talking about in Hungary is the EU's first non-democracy as a member state. Uh, I think that's well accepted. So this is not to say. Okay, Hungary is the same, or France is the same as Hungary. But there are problems, and that's the importance of what the Commission is doing in terms of this uh, monitoring. Because when these problems arise, uh, these things, uh, the, the trust and the cultural factors and the norms which fuel the rule of law, which are important for upholding the rule of law, they disappear very, very quickly. We saw what happened in the States. We're seeing what's happening in the UK. Uh, so we need the Commission, therefore, I would say, and the European Union institutions, not only need to find a way to monitor these things very closely, report very quickly, but to act very, very, very quickly. And just take one example, Joe, sorry, just to take a bit of time. I mean, there has been important legal tools used, um, but when it takes a long time, for example, for the European Court of Justice to come to a judgment. In, in our case, the Central European University was long gone from Budapest by the time the Central the European Court of Justice said the uh, Hungarian law was, um, was illegal, was contrary to EU law. So there needs to be a way to, to uh, have some kind of interim measures in place, interim fines, interim suspensions, while these legal proceedings are going on over time. And I think the European Commission could look a little bit more into that, because these things go very fast. Thank you very much, Carl, uh, for that. But I need to stress, of course, uh, that both the governments in Poland and in Hungary were practically elected. 
that you may not you may say there may be weakening democracy but the people in those two countries have elected and re-elected them we must stress that uh, that they have a mandate to do whatever they're doing the people have decided to vote for them on numerous occasions i'm going to end with uh, renata nikolai uh, from the eurova cabinet with your final thoughts please renata Thank you very much, Joe. I think you made an important point um, uh, that, you know, we have to respect the will of the people um, in elections, but we also have to be uh, very important watchdogs in this. Uh, and I think also the last comments that we heard from the audience clearly show that we're, we are at a stage in the European Union where, and I said this several times, we are dealing with these matters in a much more mature way than we ever did before, which is good. But we also have to keep on explaining that we are doing this on an equal footing and equal basis for all member states. I think if we kind of, you know, um, abuse um, this kind of these matters of rule of law, democracy, fundamental rights to kind of, you know, point fingers to certain member states only and not have an overview on the situation in the EU at large, we are making a big, big mistake. And also on the point of Carl, uh, yes, infringements, tough measures to go to the European of Court of Justice will continue to be used by us. But there's also something called due process. There's also something called that we need to kind of have proper proceedings on that. Uh, and I want to stress again, not all rule of law matters can be put into an infringement. This is a very, very tough work. We are with these kind of uh, court proceedings entering also new territory. We have to be careful what can be used for, for an infringement matter and what can be dealt with in a different way. That's my, that's why to finish, my hope is that we need to get better in preventing the problem in having that constant dialogue based on the rule of law report, which will become an annual exercise. So it will be a permanent possibility to stay in touch with member states, very much like we do on the European semester on macroeconomic side. We need to come to the same level on rule of law matters because I am convinced that this will help us to prevent things from happening much more easily. It will not probably work all the time, but we will be in a better structure to deal with the issues early on so that you know we can deal with it, try to resolve it, so that we might not come to the issue of infringements or sanctioning in a later stage. Renata Nicolai, the chef de cabinet uh, with the European Commission's uh, Vera Jourova, Vice President Vera Jourova's cabinet, Carl Dolan, uh, the Deputy Director, the Head of Advocacy at the Open Society of European Policy Institute, Claire Forçon from the, women, the European Women's Lobby, and Mark Alexander Friedrich, the Head of International Affairs for Metro AG. Thank you all. Thank you for giving up your time and your expertise. I learned a lot uh, today. And from me, Joe Lynham, and from all the team, Forum Europe, the European Movement International, uh, as well as Metro, who kind of helped us out. Thank you. Goodbye.